Hey, fellow mathematicians, welcome to the podcast where math is figure outable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. We answer the question if not algorithms, then what? In today's episode, we thought we'd share some of the biggest influencers on us, those who have really impacted our work. Yeah, and there are a bunch of people who have influenced us both in teaching and pedagogy, but today we're just going to stick with those who have really impacted our mathematics and teaching mathematics. So, um, Pam, you've probably impacted me the most um, on my math. So let's talk a little bit about those who have influenced you. Let's start with your early influencers. Okay, cool. So how do I even start? Because there's so many, and to be really clear, we're only going to be able to mention a few today. So if I leave you out, please know that it's just because we had to choose just a a few. We're going to shout out um, 10 influencers today. And uh, today, uh, right now, I'll start with the early influencers. So first, I'd like to shout out to Janie Shelak at A&M, who gave me an early reading list. I had met her, and I, I asked her one day, hey, is there a better way to teach elementary math? And she gave me a reading list to start with. And one of my first memories is I picked up some replacement units by Marilyn Burns. And as a secondary high school teacher, I'd never heard of Marilyn Burns. It's funny now because now I know, right? Marilyn Burns, like every, if you teach elementary math, of course you've heard of Marilyn Burns. She's a venerable force in the teaching of math. And what really impacted me um, by reading her work was that it gave me this inkling that math and math teaching just might be different than I had originally thought. And it kind of set the stage for me to really want to dive into other possibilities. Um, one thing that I was really impressed and then continue to be impressed with her work is that her math is correct. Her, her mathematics are solid. Um, and so it was really good for me to, to be able to dive in and get this sort of flavor and this feel for how math and math ed could be different. Um, Janie also gave me um, a couple of the books, Investigations in Data, Number, and Space. That's one of the NSF curriculums that had come out, Investigations in Data, Number, and Space. And I I read some of the number books, um, and it really was fascinating to me. Again, it had this different picture of what math could be like and what I I was really clear. I didn't learn math that way, Um, but, but... but I could recognize that I could have, that I could have done more thinking and reasoning about math if I'd had some of the tasks that were in investigations in data, number, and space. And I was so interested in sort of some of the, the games that they were playing in there and some of the, the rich tasks that they had that I began to work with my kids' teachers and do some model lessons in their classrooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used those. Uh, Kim, the very first uh, time that you and I met in that, in that one workshop, mm-hmm. we played Close to 100. Yep. Close to 100 was a game from investigations. Yeah, I remember when you started doing work in our schools um, and that one of the pieces that you brought to us was investigations. And and I'm, it's funny that I'm thinking about it back now, because do you remember that my principal at the time kind of <laughs> wanted to know, hey, is this stuff legit? Is it is it like is this going to fly in our school? Yeah, you kind of told me that, that she she came to you guys and she's like, who's this Pam? Like, she's like this. <laughs> She's this mom in the district. Why are we changing everything according to what she's talking about? Yeah. Maybe, maybe we need to go to the real training. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we did. Uh-huh. We did. We, <laughs> a couple of us went to the official real investigation uh, investigations training, and um, I remember so clearly, even all these years later, feeling like we knew what was going on. And I remember calling you on the car ride home Mm -hmm. and putting you on speaker and saying, oh my gosh, we have got this stuff down. And and not even just having a clear picture about what was happening in investigations, but really understanding a lot more deeply what was happening than, than, gosh, even, even the leaders could express. Um, so like you, you'd gone to this like correct training yeah. to make sure that, that, that what I was doing with you guys wasn't just some crazy craziness. Yep. And, and you guys realized that because of some of the other work that we had done, mm-hmm. some of the other things that I had brought into the training, that we were doing investigations data in number and space really well, right? Yep. We were like, we were seeing kind of, um, 
we weren't making some of the common mistakes that were being made around the country. It was a sort of interesting. And, and I remember when you, you and I were talking about that, I think your principal's even in the car, right? She went yep. with you guys. Yep. So, yep. And we, the more that we talked, we realized that one of the huge influences that um, had been on us and on the work that we'd been doing with investigations, the reason that we were implementing it so well um, was because of some other work that we'd read. Uh, we, we had been reading Kathy Fosno and Martin Dolk's Young Mathematicians at Work series. And that series had, it had, was really the lens through which we then did everything else. And I don't think it was until that point when you and I both realized, oh, there's something, I mean, like we knew Fosno and Dolk's work was really good, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we hadn't quite realized how much it was influenced everything else we were doing. And the more work that I've done over time, that has continued to be true that I, I recognize that now I look at math and math education through this very important lens that Fosno and Dalt gave us in their young mathematicians at work series. They do this brilliant thing uh, in the beginning of each of their four books. So there's their series of a series of four professional books. Um, they have constructing number sense, addition, subtraction, constructing multiplication, division, uh, constructing fraction decimals percents and constructing algebra. They do this amazing, brilliant thing in the beginning of each of the books. In the first chapter, they describe a math class and it's a, a teacher launching a rich task and it's a, it's a cool, rich task. They are brilliant curriculum writers and they show the interaction between the teachers and the students. And it's, it's a fascinating study of what math could really be like, what math teaching could actually be like. And then part of the brilliance is that in the second chapter, they wreck it. So it's like they, they tell about a teacher in the first chapter that launches this rich task and how well it goes and the interaction between the kids and the questioning and the conferring. And then in the second chapter, they have a fine teacher trying to do something almost like what you saw in the first chapter, but then this, this well-meaning teacher does just these little things that, that make it nosedive, that make the the task not truly problematic. That's a phrase from Fosno, a truly problematic situation. Instead of making it truly problematic, it turns it into more of a word problem. And, and again, it's a well-meaning teacher trying to get reasoning out of students, trying to do um, rich tasks, but but because of some just little things that could sort of go awry, kind of wreck it, kind of make it not go well. And so it's this sort of example in chapter one and then this non-example in chapter two. And that's just part of what you can get out of their work that can really help you kind of ferret out, oh, like I can take something like in investigations, data, number, and space, take a, a good rich task and, and I could inadvertently kind of wreck it, kind of make it not go as well. Or or I could do uh, some of the questioning and conferring and, and teacher moves that are happening in chapter one and make it be this rich experience for um, for teachers and students. Little things that fine teachers can either sort of implement and make the things go really well or mm -hmm. uh, or not implement and kind of undermine what could be really good learning. It's really fascinating stuff. I'm so glad that you brought Fosno up. She's amazing, right? Um, do you remember the first time that I ever went to New York City? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. we we were about to take um, the district uh, wide training. Um, we were about up to that point. Up to that point, I'd been doing kind of the vertical training. So, like if a, a K two teacher uh, would come to training for half the day, they would come to me, and I would kind of do this vertical big big picture. And then in the second half of the day, they would go to a grade level specific training, grade level leaders. And at that point you were one of our, I think third or fourth grade, uh -huh. grade yeah. level expert teachers, right? Yep. But if we were going to take it district wide, we needed to have, uh, there, there were too many teachers for me to be able to do that, that uh, big training all in one room. And so we needed more vertical trainers right. and, uh, and, and we were trying, we, we created you to be one of those vertical trainers. Yeah. And so the, in true district fashion, right, they sent me to New York to meet Fosno and to do, uh, work with her. And do you remember that I called you? Apparently I <laughs> call you after training, but yep. I called and I remember standing on the street of New York with a piece of pizza and calling you and kind of screaming through the wind and saying, it's not Fosnot. It's Fosno, because for all of that time, we had been saying her name incorrectly. 
Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, because I totally, her name is spelled F-O-S-N-O-T and I'd never met her. I had just read her. And so I called her Fosnot and, and I was looking forward to you sharing all this great math learning and all this <laughs> pedagogy and everything and all the, all the things you could tell me was I'm eating New York pizza on the street of New York and we're pronouncing your name wrong. Sure enough. And so, and, yeah. Yeah. To Keep- this day, when I see something <laughs> super traditional, I like to call it a Fosnot. Yeah, sure. You'll you'll call me and you'll go, hey, Pam, I got a Foz knot for you. And we'll we'll sort of chuckle about that a little bit. So yeah, everybody, you might have seen her name. All right, it is pronounced Foz No, Kathy Foz No. Um, she's fabulous. Yeah. Okay. So those are some great um, K5 leaders. Uh, what or who would you say has the greatest impact on your higher math? math? Yeah, you bet. So we're still talking about some of those early influencers. So I'd really like to give a shout out to my cooperating teacher, Pam Giles. Um, She was one of the very first teachers to teach with graphing calculators. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit. Graphing calculators had just come out when I was a student teacher. And in a huge way, that was the first time ever that I got a glimpse of what mathematics really is that um, I could type in a function into that graphing calculator and I could mess with the parameters and all of a sudden I could see those the the parent function shift around and I could I could I could um, play with the math I could test things out and I could I could sort of teach myself things I could actually see that the stuff that the book was telling me was true actually happened like it was there and through Texas Instruments and their T-Cubed um, Teachers Teaching with Technology program, I really learned to leverage the power of technology um, and the power of visualization, that, that, that there was a connection between visual mathematics and the symbolic mathematics, and that that connection was important. Sometimes, even today, um, teachers will say, oh yeah, it's all about multiple representations, to which I'll push back on a little bit, and I'll say, it's not really just about the multiple representations. It's about the connections mm-hmm. between the multiple representations. And so I really um, give a lot of, of credit to Texas Instruments and, and T-Cubed and a lot of learning. I, I met some phenomenal, fantastic educators that really not only um, – we're helping me understand the math better, but their passion for teaching kids uh, really caught hold. And, and I was able to sort of work with them um, remotely, uh, not just the people in my school, but I, I started to have colleagues uh, in the bigger world and, and be able to, to uh, share strategies with them. At that same time, one of those T-Cubers was Jerry Murdoch. Um, and he, Jerry Murdoch and the Ellen and Eric Kamishki um, had written a series called Discovering Algebra, Discovering um, Algebra and Discovering Advanced Algebra. And Kim, I can't tell you, when I met Jerry and I started reading their books, it, that was the, a, a point. They were, again, one of those um, NSF-funded projects. Uh, I got a hold of their very first um, uh, uh, version of their book, and it was paperback, and it was two huge paperback, like the, just the Algebra One book were these two huge paperback books. I read every page. They had written notes to the teacher about the math. I was learning. I mean, I'd been teaching high school math already by, I don't know, like six years by that point. I was learning so much about the mathematics as I read their teacher book. Sometimes I'm, I'm actually still sad a little bit. They uh, then had a publisher that got a hold of it. And the publishers were fine, but they did what publishers do. And they cut out a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And they kind of made it more refined. And ah, and in the process, they got rid of what I thought was some really, really excellent notes to teachers. So my hat is off to, to the Discovery Math folks. Uh, Key Curriculum Press gave them a good start to to really talk about what it meant to um, have kids think and reason in higher math. And it's kind of come full circle a little bit with your work with Discovering Algebra. (laughs) Yeah. So now I I joined the authorship team. Uh, Jerry Murdoch passed away a few years ago. Um, I got to meet his wonderful wife, uh, wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, so I sort of took his place on the authorship team for Discovering Advanced Algebra. And I really feel lucky to, again, now be working with the Comiskeys to continue to write. So yeah, really that's really cool. Very blessed there. Yeah, that's really cool. You've had some really influential people in your past. So we're still learning and growing, right? Along uh, with yep. those names. Never die, never die. Never die. <laughs> Along with those names, who is currently on your influential list? Like who who should we want to know about? Yeah, so let's talk about my top five current influencers. Okay. So unfortunately, we're going to skip. Like we kind of talked about my top five beginning, and now we're going to kind of go into the current. So we'll skip a bunch, but... Currently, you might find it interesting that Kathy Fosno is still on that list. She is a brilliant curriculum writer. Um, Just last year, I went to visit her in the booth. Hey, Kathy, how's it going? Um, 
And, and uh, I overheard her talking to a teacher who asked her about CRA, that, that uh, modeling idea of concrete representational abstract. And I kind of hadn't ever heard Kathy respond to that. I had a, had a feeling I've read enough of her stuff. I had a feeling I knew kind of what she would say, but not quite in this way. She smiled. She got that Kathy Fosno smile on her face and she kind of shook her head a little bit. And she said to that teacher, oh, that's really old research. And then proceeded to talk about their sort of perspective on models and modeling and modeling and mathematics. And I really appreciate that perspective because from a secondary perspective, Kathy uh, will say she's an elementary math researcher. Um, from a secondary perspective, she's spot on. Um, all too often, I will meet really good elementary people that have um, kind of a limited view of how it would um, how it would sort of go up in higher mathematics. But the way that Foz and Adult talk um, and write about modeling mathematics works for secondary, for higher math as well. And so it's really important. Um, and so stay tuned, uh, listeners, because we have planned some podcast episodes where we're going to talk more about models and modeling and mathematics and yes. how it's not really about concrete representational abstract, but there's a whole different way of looking at models in mathematics. Um, you might have noticed that lately on social media, we've put out some graphics where we've asked teachers, are you looking at two models? If you had to choose, is it two models, two strategies, one of each? How, how are you How are you seeing? And we'll, we'll sort of give a picture of two models or sometimes two strategies or sometimes one of each. And, and it's fascinating to see the confusion that's out there, that people mm -hmm. are really are a little bit unclear on the difference between models and strategies. And then they're also unclear on... Um, the difference between a model of a situation and a model of student thinking and that those are different. And that sort of impacts kind of how we look at things like Singapore math and some other things that are out there. So again, stay tuned. We'll, uh, we'll try to do justice to that, those big ideas in some upcoming episodes. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's really important stuff. So who else, Pam, who's, who's, making your brain think right now. Yeah. So talking about the power of technology, Desmos. Um, if you teach secondary math at all, you're, you're familiar with Desmos, the online free graphing calculator. Um, it's not just a free online graphing calculator. They have come up with some teacher tasks and teacher activities. Uh, hit their teacher activity center, check out some of their most popular. You'll see some most popular things like the marble slides and, and some other things. They're cool. I, they're good. They're excellent. I recommend them. But also note that you can do some really nice things with card sorts. Teachers, if you're about to do some remote instruction coming mm -hmm. up this fall, um, we're feeling for you on that. We're going to have some Facebook Lives coming up that will talk all about how you can do some real math teaching uh, remotely. But also check out Desmos. Even if you're a, a K-5 teacher, I think there's some things that you could do with card sorts in Desmos. You can make your own so easy. I swear it's easier to make a card sort in Desmos than it is to make a, uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm saying the words <laughs> card sort. Um, Kim and I have made plenty of card sorts by, by hand, right? Where you copy them off and you cut them out and you laminate them and the whole, it, it's so easy to create a card sort on Desmos. So check those out. Um, also, they have a thing called polygraphs. That's one of their uh, types of teacher tasks super duper way of teaching properties and vocabulary. One of the harder things to teach, we like to teach vocabulary just in time where you sort of put students in a situation where they need to use the vocabulary and bam, polygraphs do that. Um, it's, it's really puts students in this position where they, they're, they need to talk to each other about what they're seeing on their screens. And in order to do that, then you supply the vocabulary that they can use. So uh, some fantastic ways of really getting kids uh, to learn. Um, if, if you're teaching remotely again uh, this coming school year, I would highly recommend, um, especially middle school and high school, though there are some pretty fantastic um, elementary tasks as well. But middle school and high school, I would definitely look at using Desmos to do some of those remote um, teaching. And not only remote, also in classroom, but, but both, they uh, could be really handy. If I was in a middle school, high school classroom this fall, I would be using Desmos um, remotely, um, and, like I said, and in class. So really good. Um, and then uh, let's, let's move on to another influencer. Kim, you know, I was really hesitant to get into social media. I'm not, a, I'm, it was a whole conversation. Between, I'm like, Kim, teach me how to Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Facebook. I think there's some really kind of weird things that um, there's the comparison trap that my friends were getting into on Facebook. And I think there's some things that we have to be careful with. However, I also really appreciate uh, the MIT boss atmosphere. Now I'm saying, I'm, I'm sort of pronouncing this thing that no one knows how to pronounce. M-T-B-O-S stands for the Math Twitter Blogosphere. 
and some people pronounce it MTBOS, some people pronounce it MITBOS. It, it literally is a group of fantastic uh, mathematics educators who got together and said, we can harness the math Twitter blogosphere. We can share with each other and learn from each other. And uh, I'm so glad I dove into that world. Y'all, if you're not familiar with MitBoss, um, sometimes it, it, it might look a little bit like um, it's kind of a secret club and you don't know how to get in. I, it kind of looked like that way to me too at first and um, I, at conferences. I just started kind of hanging out with people that said they were involved. And sure enough, that's what you do. You just like dive in and, and uh, know that when you dive in, we will welcome you with open arms. Um, I know that a lot of people use the hashtag MTBOS um, and the hashtag I teach math. I think both of those are fine hashtags to sort of follow on social media to really get involved in kind of this group of people that are really out there to um, help each other. It's uh, I, I, the one thing I really like about it is people are in there just to like, you know, share things that they create and share ideas that they have and really blog about the way they're teaching. Um, I'll mention a specific uh, person that's um, in the blogosphere out there right now that I'm um, I'm learning from right now has really influenced my my really recent work uh, is Peter Lilliedal um, and his his work with the Thinking Classroom. I think his book's about to come out, so I recommend that you check that out. Uh, he he has suggested that we can get kids up vertically at non permanent surfaces. So think of a whiteboard or chalkboard, something that, that I can erase really easily. Um, and by getting people up at those vertical non-permanent surfaces that kind of get, get people thinking and, um, and really put them in an atmosphere of, of uh, problem solving and, and kind of a different way than it, uh, the different energy than when they're sitting at, at flat tables. So I'm not totally doing that justice right now, uh, but that might be a place where you look up if you want to get some inspiration, uh, Peter Lilliedahl, you can find him, his work of the thinking classroom. Um, and then all of the chats and slow chats on Twitter uh, inspired me to create math strat chat. Yeah, we love math strat chat, right? And you, oh, totally. you've heard us talk about it. If you've listened before, you can join us on math strat chat every Wednesday on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's just where Pam throws out a problem and asks people to share their strategy and comment on each other's strategies. Yeah, totally. It's like it's like one big number talk. We mm -hmm. just kind of, though I would call it a problem talk. So we're not really talking about numbers. We're talking about problems. But it's just this huge problem talk where I throw out a question. People from all around the world throw out their throw in their answers, and I'm I'm really loving that lately. A lot of people are helping me comment on other strategies. That's probably my favorite way for people to participate is to read the question solve the question, the problem, whatever it is, uh, submit your strategy. And I, I even like it when people say, Hey, I, this, I, I, I've just solved it. This is what I was thinking about before I look at anyone else's. And then they go and comment on other strategies. Right. So that's, that's like my fit. You can totally just lurk. You can just come and just see what other people are doing. Um, but it's also really great for you to, to submit your strategy, even if it's one that someone else has put in there, because then it kind of gives all of us an idea of what are some common ways that people are thinking about the problem. And who knows, you might have, the first of its kind and then we'll sort of celebrate you as woohoo that's the first time we've seen that strategy tonight so um i'd love to have you join us on master chat excellent who else pam who you got anybody else you want to share about all right just uh real quick um joe bowler uh i think uh, a lot of if you're in math ed these days you've heard about joe bowler her brain research really helped me think about uh, time and speed and that fast is not equal good at math and that visual models are as important as Kathy Fosno suggests. They, their work on b making thinking visible um, is, uh, works really well in tandem. Um, she's also giving me, Joe Bowler has given me some words to talk about how my brain works differently when I'm either pulling from rote memory, sort of retrieving from memory versus when I'm thinking, reasoning, and mathematizing. And then the last group that I'll just mention I'm so grateful for the university students and the teachers that I work with um, every day in workshops. I learn from them. I, I now listen to those uh, that I'm working with differently than before. I'm really working hard uh, to understand their thinking and their reasoning. It's my place to practice and refine my own teaching and cement ideas that I'm grappling with. Yeah. Thanks for sharing those with us. We would love to invite you to think about who's been influential in your math teaching, who's helped you become the teacher you are today. And you can share that with us on social media and hashtag math is figureoutable. 
Cool. So did you know that if you like a podcast and give it a review, then more people can see it. It'll show up uh, more. The, the, the podcast sites will, will uh, suggest it to more people. So true stuff. If you, if you don't mind, uh, if you actually like the podcast, then click that like and give us a review. If you're interested to learn more, you can check us out on our, our website, mathisfigureoutable.com. So if you're interested to learn more math and you want to help students think like mathematicians, then the Math is Figure Outable podcast is for you. Because math is figure out of it.